Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Turn to Acts 11.22. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about elders. Mainly this topic is about boldness and an apology to a brother in Christ. Okay. Uh, I didn't go th about things the, the Bible way. I, I, I'm getting ahead of myself so I don't want to get ahead of myself. So if you please get out your King James Bibles and please follow along. We're going to try to make this a short video. And we're going to get back to some other studies and, and get back to, hopefully this, this study encourages the brethren, but make sure you have your King James Bibles out and you're following along, okay? This is the most precious prized possession we have. No matter how bad it gets out there, the one thing I always try to hold on to is this. Okay, it's one thing I always pray to the Lord. I say, if bad things happen, I lose the house, I lose the car, I get thrown into a uh, quarantine camp. Um, let me have my Bible. Let me have your word with me wherever I go. Now we're supposed to hide God's word in our hearts. Um, and there's times where the Lord shows me that he's blessed me with a better memory than I think I have. Because I think I don't think I always have the best memory. And I'm walking and talking with them and I'm quoting scripture. And the Lord says, see, you've got it in your heart. But we got to stay in this every day to keep it in our hearts. Or else we'll forget it. Okay. But this is the most prized physical possession that you have, brothers and Christ, is the King James Bible, okay. God's perfect written word. So Acts 11.20, make sure you turn to Acts 11.20. We're going to start by talking about some elders, and then we're going to talk about boldness, and I got a big apology I got to make. Okay. Acts 11.22, then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch, who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad, and exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. That's my prayer too, that you cleave unto the Lord. That's what I've always been trying to preach, brothers says Christ. Keep your eyes on the Lord through his perfect written word. We can look at what's going on out here in the world, but be careful not to get fearful about what's going on in the world. To get distracted by what's going on in the world. Okay? Cling to the Lord. Hold that which is good. Cleave unto the Lord. Verse 24. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people were added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that, that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. Today in these last days, we look at those days and say, wow, that, was, that must have been wonderful. You know, we're so separated today. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. You know, remember, this is a Syrian text from Antioch. Text, the King James Bible, where Christians were first called Christians. All the other Bible perversions um, come from Alexandria, Egypt. It's an Alexandrian text. They don't like to tell you that. But a lot of the brethren have gone through the Bible version issue that Brother Brian puts out on his channel. Um, some other brethren have done Bible version issue studies. You figure it out and go, okay, these other Bibles don't even come from the same place of the world as the King James Bible. Verse 27. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. And there stood up one of them named Argabus, and signified by the Spirit that they should that there should be great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Verse 29. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Okay, That's the first time that I believe, I mean, if I'm wrong and you can correct me, please correct me, but I tried to go through New Testament. That's the first time elders is referred to when it comes to Christians, the church, the body of Christ. Okay. But they sent it to the elders, plural. Remember that, elders, plural. Now turn to Acts 14.21. Turn to Acts 14.21. And when they had preached the gospel to, the, to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystria and to Iconium and Antioch, 
confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. That's what my joy, that's, that's what my, I suppose to say my joy, but I, t I take joy when I hear brethren that are continuing in the faith. And I try to encourage brethren that have failed to continue in the faith. That's why I always preach that verse that Jesus said, his own words said, if any man come after me, he must deny himself, pick up his cross daily. It says daily and follow me. Every day you got to pick up your cross and start following the Lord. Anytime you drop your cross, my encouragement is to pick that cross back up and continue to follow the Lord and continue in the faith. This is where we get our faith as far as what we believe in. Absolute truth. Continue in the Word of God. We're going to get a, I'm getting ahead of myself, but be careful about philosophy, traditions, what's going on in the world, rudiments of the world. And what's that going to do? It's going to distract you from going after Christ. It's going to get in the way. Continue in the faith. And that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. This day as a Christian in this church age, from the death of Jesus Christ to the catching away of the body of Christ, there's going to be tribulation. You look in the past of uh, the martyrs, the Christians that have died, the Christians that have had to live tough, hard lives to stand for the word of God and for the real Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. There's been tribulation today. But people say, well, you see that? That means Christians are going through the time of Jacob's trouble. No, it doesn't. Okay. That's for today. Verse 23. Remember, kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven is always a reference to the, uh, the physical reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. Kingdom of God can be a reference to the, he the spiritual kingdom. Or it can be a reference to the physical kingdom. Okay, But I believe here... Let tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Okay. Verse 23. And when they had ordained them elders, they ordained elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. So elders were something that people put their hands on. They prayed, they fast, and they ordained elders. They'd send stuff to the elders. They'd write letters to the elders to read to the church. When Paul's writing to the church of Corinth, he's writing to the elders, I believe. And the elders are reading that letter out to the body of Christ. They have ordained them elders in every church and have prayed with fasting. They commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. Elders plural, not singular. The point I want to make out here with the elders is that it's plural. There are supposed to be multiple elders. But God is not about the one-man show. Okay, that's what really, I think, really weighs heavy on my heart with this ministry. I don't want to be a one-man show. God's not for a one-man show. I understand in these last days with our separation and the falling away, the Bible talks about how there's a falling away before the man of sin, the man of perdition, uh, before the Antichrist can show up for the catching away of the bice, catching away of the body of Christ happens. There's going to be a falling away among the body of Christ. Not falling away like we're going to find out who's saved and who's lost, who's really saved and who's lost. That's there, but I believe the falling away. Brother Brian did a great study on this, and I still watch it a lot. The uh, the um, oh gosh, now I forgot the name of it. Um, the falling, the great falling away, or something like that, where he's talking about, he used to believe it's uh, false people, false converts, but now he, after studying it, and I agree, after studying it, it's talking about people who are saved. They're in a standing position. They're saved, and they fall away. They start getting distracted by the world, and they start resurrecting the old man. They start saying, "Well, I'm going to believe this, but I'm going to compromise so I can hang out with." these Babel building people and this and that and they fall away and their life is just gets destroyed as a Christian the falling away mm -hmm. um, but the one-man show okay God's not for a one-man show but I'm just wanting you to know I understand why it's hard to have more than one person like 
there was another brother in Christ that was felt called into ministry and he lived in this area, I'd work with him and do a ministry together. Okay? Even if it was just a small ministry of going out and standing up with signs and handing out gospel tracts. And, uh, you know, we t and we come together once a week to talk about the Word of God and everything. And then if we get more, then you have a house church or something. But the point is, is it's elders plural. Okay? The whole point of that, and I didn't put this in the study, it's a whole other study, but you have elders that when there's disagreements among the brethren, you take it to the elders. And the elders are not someone who's newly saved. They're not someone who's a novice. They're not someone who's a babe in Christ. They're people that are supposed to, you know, they've been saved for a while, they've gone through some experiences, they're elders as far as age also, because they've experienced things even as a lost person and a saved person, okay? They're elders, but they're supposed to be ordained. Mark 6, 7, if you want to turn there, Mark 6, 7, why do I believe God's not for a one-man show when it comes to ministry? Well, Mark 6, 7, when he was doing his earthly ministry, what did he do? And he, called unto, uh, and he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over un unclean spirits. Jesus, when he sent them out to, do, to preach the gospel back then, was the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, the physical kingdom. That's why you got to be careful going and try, they'll grab a lot of things from the, the four gospels and try to apply all of it to today. You gotta remember, Jesus was first preaching the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, the physical kingdom, that he was their king. He's God fully and completely. He asked uh, Peter, who do you think I am? Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He came to rule and reign. Okay, I believe he initially, he, he knew the future, he's God. He came to pay for the sins of the world and be the savior of the whole world, but he still had to offer that to the Jewish people to be to rule and reign as their king. He still had to offer the kingdom of heaven to the Jewish people, knowing they would reject it. But as you see there, two by two. It wasn't one. Just go out one and, and, and be one. It was two by two. If you're going to go out and you're going to street witness and you're going to street preach, you don't do it by yourself. You go out two by two. Now, there's a difference between me walking on the beach with my cards, um, scripture cards, talking with the Lord, praying, praying for the brethren, talking to the Lord about what's going on in the world, and I walk by somebody that says, hello, how are you doing, and God puts it on my heart, I pull out a gospel tract, and I'll hand that person a gospel tract. Okay? That doesn't stop us from doing that, but I'm talking about like the people that go out and hold the signs, and they're on the street corner, and they're screaming, and they like me coming, trying to be a car salesman or something like that, you shouldn't be screaming hardcore. You just be hold a good good verse sign, and when people walk by, try to say, Can you, would you like to take this gospel track? Would you like to have this gospel track? No? Okay. Okay. But when you go to do stuff like that where you're in public and you're doing that, you need to go out two by two. You don't go out by yourself. And Sisters in Christ, you definitely don't go out by yourself to street witness. Okay? You go two by two. Bible says before, where there's, uh, before two or three witnesses, let every word be established. You go out there with two or more people to preach the gospel. Every word be established. Okay? You say, well, that's, that's Jesus, and that's just the earthly ministry. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9. We read here, this is Paul. He's writing to Timothy. He says, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. Verse 10, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Okay, I've seen brethren that they, they start doing videos and then they disappear. They want to be in ministry and then they disappear. Um, I've seen people that were, for, were false and they fall away. Okay, but today for what we're talking about, in the last days, the falling away, I've seen saved brothers that loved, wanted to be in ministry and wanted to try, and they just fell away. Okay? They've forsaken me. They've forsaken Brother Brian. They've forsaken Brother JT. Okay? Um, they've, forsa they've forsaken, um, I don't know if anybody has forsaken Brother Brad Avonshine, 
Yeah, but I'm pretty sure he's got people that have turned on him. Okay? But men in ministry. Uh, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Right. We talked about this before. I don't believe those two fell away. I just believe he's saying I had to send them over here because the brethren over here needed them. He still wasn't a one-man show if there's brethren there. Okay, And he's got to send this person here and that person there. Verse 11, only Luke is with me. There's two of them there, Luke and Paul. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable for me for the ministry. And Tychus have I sent to Ephesus. Okay, and you write letters back and forth, you stay in contact, I, I believe they're writing letters, because right now what is Paul doing? He's writing a letter to Timothy. You still stay in contact so it's not a one-man show. Okay, God's not for one-man show. So in these last days when I say the body of Christ is, is in a very tough, hard position, the Bible preached it. God preached it here saying the last days are going to be tough. You know, he talks about the falling away. He talks about it being like Sodom and Egypt in the time of Jacob's trouble. But that's not going to just pop up like we get caught up in tomorrow. Then it becomes like Sodom and Egypt. It's getting that way today and we can see it. The persecution of the church. He talked about martyrs and persecution of the church. How people who kill you think they do with God's service. Right? He talked about it getting hard in these last days for the church. We're not... We're all spread out. We need to keep encouraging each other through, through uh, letters, through emails. Uh, if you have the ability to Skype some of the brethren and get with a group of brethren that you Skype and talk to every week and you confess your faults to them and you encourage each other to keep standing for the truth. Oh, you dropped your cross, pick up your cross and continue going on. It's desperately needed today. Don't get me wrong, in Hebrews when it talks about not forsaking the fellowship of the gathering of ourselves together, that's for the time of Jacob's trouble. But for instruction and righteousness, it helps the body of Christ to stay in prayer for one another. And if it's at all possible, to stay in fellowship. To not be breaking fellowship over things that aren't worth breaking fellowship over. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. So we talked about when it first mentioned elders. Talked about how they send things to the elders to hand out. And we talked about uh, the ordaining of elders and the fact that it's elders plural. It's multiple people. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. It says here, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Elders, plural, that rule well. Okay, be worthy of double honor. And this is where we're going to get into my apology. All right. Double honor. I want to read the whole scripture first. Especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Okay? Uh, Bible studies. Good Bible studies are always going to be the ones where they labor in the word and doctrine. There's a difference between preaching. I believe there's a difference between preaching and teaching. Like Bible studies and Bible preaching where you might use a few scriptures and you preach testimonies. You give a testimony. You let people know that what you've seen go on in the world as it applies to the Bible. And you can give, you know, what God put on your heart. But then there's those solid, good Bible studies. Okay? Where you are laboring in the word and doctrine. 18. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward, both in heaven, and he's worthy to have food and raiment on this earth. Well, he needs to get a job. No, he's worthy to have food and raiment. The reason we donate money to brethren in ministry is so they don't have the cares of this world coming in and distracting them from being able to serve God fully in ministry. Verse 19, they're worthy of it. Against, and here's the big thing, against an elder receive not an accusation but before, two, but before three witnesses. Them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. Now, some brother might have noticed I went ahead and took down those two studies I did where I called out Brother Brian. And the reason I took them down is not because I believe I was wrong with the scriptures. I believe the scriptures teach what true liberty is. Okay. 
I took it down because I failed that passage right there, 19. Against an elder received not an accusation, but before, uh, before uh, two or three witnesses. Okay. Now first, before I get into that, I want to say this about Brother Brian. Okay, He's worthy of double honor. Okay. People, uh, there's some people that try to sneak in, and from this day forward, when a brother comes in and says, "Well, Brother Brian celebrates Christmas, what are you, what are you doing about that?" I've preached truth on it. I've preached truth to him on it. I've preached tr truth on it, on true liberty. Okay. At this point, my response to that is pray for him. Pray for him. Pray that brother that God will open Brother Brian's eyes. Just like Brother Brian, I pray, is praying that God will open my eyes okay, to the truth. Okay? He answered the call. I'm talking about how He affected me and my life. And I'm going to try to do it without getting too emotional. Okay? He answered the call. When you listen to testimonies, and if you follow Brother Brian at King James Video Ministries, from the very beginning, he got into it with the battle building system, and the battle building system came down hard on him. He could have quit. He could go, well, then I, if this is what true Christianity is, I want nothing to do with it. He could have quit and continued doing, I think he's, he was doing woodworking and stuff like that, wood turning. Right? He could have quit, but he didn't. Okay? He answered the call. Now, 1 Corinthians one twenty six says, For ye see your calling brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Brian doesn't have a PhD or THD in the, the Babel building system. You know, you have to get their approval and, and everything. He didn't have all that. He's considered a fool according to them. Verse 27, But God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. Why? That no flesh should glory in His presence. And that's mainly what these Babel buildings are all about. It's just their flesh is glorifying. Remember the scriptures that say that whose, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame? The sins of the flesh, their flesh. Right? That no flesh should glory. Brother Brian would not compromise when he started in ministry. Because he wouldn't compromise, God was able to pull him out of the Babel building system and set him on the truth. This. He labored um, in the Word and doctrine, but first he labored hardcore to show us that this is God's perfect written Word, the Bible version issue. Okay. Then his Bible studies, you go watch his ministry from the beginning to the end. Anybody who's new to King James Video Ministries, I always tell them, if you want to do right, like as a babe and not get too messed up as a babe in Christ, go to his ministry or YouTube channel. Uh, I'll link it down below. There's a great YouTube channel that, uh, I don't know if that's the, it'll work. Maybe you have to go to his regular channel. I'll link both of them. But his first channel that he used, I, when I first got saved, I said, show the oldest videos first. I didn't go for the newest videos first. I said, show the oldest videos first. I went through all his Bible version issue studies first, that, that um, playlist that he had. And then I said, well, you know what? I want to go from the beginning to the end. And he starts out and he starts preaching milk with some meat. And then today you see him preach a lot of hardcore meat. Sorry, there's a plane going by. And sometimes he goes back to the milk, because we can't forget the milk. Okay? But he didn't compromise. And he set the standard for us not to compromise. He led me to the Bible version issue. He led me to the Lord. I got saved by Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit because Brother Brian answered the call. Could God have brought some, the truth to me through somebody else? He could have. But remember, Many are called, but few are chosen. And I always use that for instruction and righteousness when it comes to ministry. Very few people, uh, there's many that are called. There's many men trying to be in ministry, but they don't last long. Why? Because few are chosen. Few 
say, you know what, I'm going to give my life to Christ in ministry. Lord, I'm yours. Tell me what to do. No matter, and we're going to get into this, no matter what the cost. Some of us forget the cost. That, and I'm going to talk about some of mine and what Brother Brian, the cost that men who stick it out in ministry, no matter how much tough times come along, no matter what sacrifices they make, no matter what losses they suffer, they stick with it. All I'm going through all this because it says when we read there, let the er er elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Double honor. Is Brian worthy of double honor? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. He led me to the Lord. He guided me with my walk with the Lord. All these Bible teachings that he did, showing the scriptures to me, expository studies, the subject studies, the major doctrine studies, Okay, I wish he'd go back and finish his expository study. He talked about doing an expo uh, expository study on Hebrews for instruction in righteousness. I wish he'd go back and finish the Pauline epistles. I agree with Brother Brian. We, know, we shouldn't be doing an expository study on all the, the, ver the uh, books in the Bible. Okay, it's not all written to us. It's not all dispensations for us. And we're not going to understand everything in a different dispensation. Okay, but the Pauline epistles, he started it. I'd like to see him finish it. Romans and 1st and 2nd Corinthians would finish the Pauline epistles that's written to the church. And then he talked about Hebrews, okay? But I went through all his studies and it helped me. It helped me sanctification, all his instruction in righteousness studies. He taught me how to study the Bible, how to do word studies, subject studies, expository studies, okay? I saw that he had colors in his Bible and I said, you know what? Because at the time that I got saved, I had a major seizure disorder, and it kind of messes up with my words sometimes when I try to say certain syllables. And I don't know if it comes out on the can on the audio, but I had a bad memory, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to do what the key does. I'm going to start highlighting. So that's where I got it from, highlighting co different colors to remember when I lift, open it up. Okay, this is for this subject. This is for that subject. And when I got saved, the Lord helped me with my memory. All glory be to God. Okay. But he's helped me with my walk. Okay, He's taught me how to study the Word and even encouraged me in ministry. He's encouraged me in ministry. And now we're going to get to it. He's, he's made a lot of sacrifices for the body of Christ. People say, well, why aren't you coming down so hardcore on him like some of the other brethren have? I think some of, the reason I did that study and I took it down and we might talk about it another time or I might redo the study another time. The main point of that study was is you've got to understand the difference between salvation issue and a sin issue. And there's brethren that have turned on Brother Brian because of Christmas saying he worships Satan and he's lost and he's a devil and all kinds of stuff. And they have just dishonored an elder in the church that's worthy of double honor. He is saved. Okay, the only person who can't see that is a lost person. He is a saved, Bible-believing, God-fearing man. He has mistakes. He's an heir in certain areas, I believe. But he's saved. And that was the whole point of that study. Okay, be careful. When you're doubting someone's salvation, make sure that you check to see if it's a sin issue. Okay, if they're struggling with the flesh, we all do. Nobody, no matter how sanctified you think they are, even Peter Ruckman struggled with the flesh. Brother Brian struggles with the flesh. We all struggle with the flesh. You need to know the difference between the two. But Brother Brian has made some major sacrifices in his life in ministry. Okay, He's had to sacrifice families. I can only talk about me personally because I don't want to go into it with he can make a video talking about it'd be great for him to make a video to let the brethren know hey maybe some of you guys have forgotten because some people jump in on a ministry and they just watch the first part few videos that he does and they don't go back to the beginning if you follow like me I, I didn't join right when he started online ministry audio ministry stuff like that but I went back and watched it from the beginning and got caught up and then started following from then on and you watch he's had to make a lot of sacrifices family Friends, he's had to lose fellowship with some of the brethren by preaching absolute truth. The big one, when he came out with the truth, the absolute truth of the Godhead, he lost a lot of brethren that turned their back, the falling away. He lost a lot of brethren that fell away and broke fellowship with them over absolute truth. 
he had to make a lot of sacrifices. Okay, he's had to sacrifice a lot of time with his wife and his son to do ministry work. Okay, he's made a lot of sacrifices. Oops. I was like, why isn't it there? Because I made a list. <laughs> now, the apology I have, and it's a public, since I made the videos public, I'm making this apology public. I didn't follow those scriptures and before two or three witnesses. Make not an accusation against an elder, but before two or three witnesses. Okay, I failed that. You saying, am I turning my back and changing my mind about Christmas? No. I'm apologizing because I name dropped him and I didn't go to him personally. Okay. Anytime you muster, here it is. Anytime you muster the courage to rebuke a brother, a brother or sister in Christ that you love with all your heart, as the Bible commands us to, a brother in Christ, for sin, you risk losing fellowship with said brethren. And I get and I'm just coming out to say I guess I was a I'm not a guess, I'm sorry, because that's not me taking full responsibility. I was a coward. I should have emailed him. I should have, I have him on Skype. I should have sent a message to him saying, I really need to talk to you. God has really put this on my heart and tried to talk with him. And then if, if he got mad and then he decided I'm not fellowshipping with you anymore, at least I did it right. I went to him and talked to him. But I was cowardly. I was scared of losing fellowship. And in the end, I lost fellowship anyway. Okay, I failed to have courage to talk with him and, and what I ended up doing was naming him in a video. It was just on my heart. I was trying to teach it a lesson and I winded up mentioning his name. Okay, And I said things that were on my heart that God put on my heart that I should have said to him one on one. I should not have said it in the video. Okay. And I'm not changing my stance okay, on what liber true liberty is. Okay. My belief is that if I can get him to see what true liberty is in the Bible, that he would understand. That was my motivation behind doing those videos. I already talked about liberty. I've already done videos on liberty. I was doing it again. And um, I thought maybe if I could do it again, or maybe if I could say it this way, maybe he would see what true liberty is in the Bible. Um, you know, because cause I, I, I made the mistake when we talked about glorious liberty. When you actually look into that, that's not for us today. That's not the catching away of the body of Christ. We don't have glorious liberty today. We have liberty today. But we don't have glorious liberty. We've already talked about that in another study. Okay. Um, someone asked me to, uh, it was in the book of John. I forgot the, the address. But it talks about um, the sons of God where, it talks, where John's talking about how we're sinless. And people try to take that and use that to try to teach sinless perfection. But if you read the whole context, it's talking about the sons of God and when we get our new bodies. And when we get our new bodies, the catching away of the body of Christ, that's what's going to separate us from the lost, from the saved. Okay? Because we're going to get incorruptible bodies where we are sinless. Okay? Glorious liberty. That's when we're going to get glorious liberty. Today we don't have glorious liberty. We just have liberty. We will have glorious liberty on that day because we are going to be liberated from the law of sin. This wicked body of flesh. Okay. But I learned something from Brother Brian. Okay. Once again, he tried to use the verse glorious liberty and he was using it the way I use it. And I started looking into that and started studying it. And it's like, you know what? I was using it wrong. That's not for us today. That whole passage talks about Jesus coming. This, we're, we become, we are, first, we're called the sons of God. Present tense, we're called the sons of God. Then someday, we're, now are we the sons of God. Okay? So we're called the sons of God. But Jesus is going to come back and redeem the purchased possession. And then we will fully be sons of God. In body, soul, and spirit. Right now, it's just in soul and spirit. Two-thirds redeemed. Okay? Um... But the whole point of me doing that study was to, I was trying to see if I could reach Brother Brian through a study. Because I was being cowardly, because I, Brother Sister Christ, it's hard. I want to, I'm not justifying my failure, and I'm not justifying my mistake. 
but any brother and sister in Christ out there that has to have confronted somebody that's a brother and sister in Christ about sin, every time you do that, you risk in these last days, with the Bible predicting the falling away, in these last days, you risk losing a brother in Christ. And remember, the whole other study I did, when you go to correct a brother in Christ, it's to put them on the right path. If you go to correct a brother in Christ that's wronged you, it's not so you can go give it to him and stab him and stab and stab him and then kick him out the door and now get out of here. That's not what it's about, okay? When you go to correct a brother that's wronged you, it's so you can get that fellowship back with that brother. There's now a wall there. You're trying to say, brother, you put that wall up there. You need to knock that wall down so our fellowship can come back together. We can come back and fellowship together. Do the work of the Lord together. Pray together. Read the Word of God together. Fellowship. That's the whole reason. Okay? It takes courage. Okay? It takes a lot of courage. It takes boldness. And these last days, I, I failed. I should have went to Brother Brian privately. And I have another brother in Christ that I have the hardest time being bold for because he's not just a brother in Christ, he's a family member. Um, there's times where I have a hard time standing up to him, you know, when I, when I believe he's wrong. Because he's, he's, you know, he's, he helped raise me a little bit growing up and he's been a, like a father figure to me in my life. He's the one that led me, he's the one that talked me into getting the King James Bible and then told me to watch all these Bible version issues, studies by Brother Brian. He, he, he found Brother Brian and he led me to Brother Brian's channel at King James Video Ministries. Um, it's tough, Brother and Sister Christ, it's very hard. Okay, why? Because any time it seems like that you go to correct a brother in Christ, there's a chance you can risk losing fellowship. You're definitely going to lose it if you do it the wrong way. Definitely going to lose fellowship if you do things the wrong way. But even if you do it the right way, you still risk losing fellowship. Anytime you go to correct someone, rebuke somebody, you do it with love. Okay? You do it with meekness, temperance, boldness. But you don't do it out of anger. You don't do it out of bitterness. Okay? The yelling, the screaming, you know. Okay. I know people are going to say, what well, are you talking about, Brother Brian? He has lost his temper before, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when you go to correct a brother in Christ one-on-one. -on -one. Make sure that you're not losing your temper, there's no bitterness in your heart, that your intentions is to get that fellowship back with that brother in Christ. Okay. Like I said, this is a public apology because I put those videos out publicly. Right. Now, Brother Brian, he sacrificed a lot for the Lord. And I just want to bring up my sacrifice because I can do it in my personal testimony to let you know that men that get into ministry that are trying to hold on, and one of the things that always got to me was that, um, Lord, if I quit, you know, or if I fall away, then the Bible says if this work be of men, it will come to naught. Now, I don't believe the work as a whole is going to come to naught, you know what I'm saying? But the lost world can use that. You see that? He came to naught, so that must mean what he's teaching is false. But there's other brethren out there teaching it. But that's not what they look at. They look at me and go, because of you, it must have been come to naught. Because, you know? And that always kind of hit me. And it's like, Brother and Sister Christ, I just want to, because like I said, I believe Brother Brian should do a video using scripture. Uh, laboring in the word scripture, showing the sacrifice, explaining to the brethren the sacrifices from start to finish. That would be a great Bible study video. And a testimony. So brethren understand, some brethren that are new don't understand what Brother Brian's been through. And some of them that are new get deceived by lost people and they turn around and they just start right going into Brother Brian and they don't understand what he's been through. The sacrifices he's made. Okay, the elder that's worthy of double honor. But the people in my life that I've had to sacrifice for absolute truth, when I first got saved, a wall started forming in front of family members. Okay, when I got saved, most of my friends, because like I said, I was a video game addict for the online video games and 
like once or twice a week, I'd meet up online with everybody to do my rating and everything. All those friends, I lost all of them. Wind up quitting video games because they're wicked and sinful. And they pull you away from the Lord. Even the ones you think are innocent, they're brain, designed to brainwash, they're designed to, for addiction, and they're designed to take your time away from doing things that would glorify God. But I lost friends. I lost family members. But the biggest sacrifices that I made in my life was my ex-wife. I had to step down from the ministry. When I'm, I, I met a woman, talked to her for six to eight months, and she said all the right things. And when we got married, she wound up not being the person she said she was. She started doing a 180 in a lot of her so-called stands for absolute truth. But the point is, is I went, that's why I did that video that I'll link below again. Um, apologies to the brethren, okay? Because I don't want to go into it too much here. Um, but bottom line, she chose, she was a professing Christian. Right now she teaches easy believism. She teaches repentance is just going from unbelief to belief. She's totally done 180 on a lot of the, the truth of the true gospel and the, being a King James Bible believer. She's not a King James Bible believer. And bottom line, she chose her flesh. She chose the ways of the world over fellowship. I say fellowship because at the time I was trying to treat her as a saved sister in Christ, a wife. She chose that over fellowship with a brother in Christ. And I had to stand my ground. And it cost me my wife to stand for the Jesus Christ of the King James Bible, the true plan of salvation, instruction and righteousness. This home, I want this home to be a Bible-believing, God-fearing home. I've had some brethren ask me, and I've had family members ask me, but the family members don't get it, but I, I pray the brethren do uh, out there. But they always ask me, are you ever going to get married again? Well, I'm 42 years old. Okay. Brother Brian, I can't remember, I think he's like 45 years old. I was shocked at the... I thought he was... If he could reach... I hope he doesn't reach through and strangle me. I thought he was a lot older than me. Um, but I'm 42 years old. Um, been saved for seven years. Brother Brian's been saved more than twice that. Um, but Brother Sister Christ, I tell him, I said, in order for her to even stand a chance... At this point, of the, the, like I said, I'll link the video for the experience that I went through, and I don't wish it on any man. That, that verse in the Old Testament talks about it's better for a man to dwell in the wilderness than to live with a contentious woman. That verse was for me, and I didn't obey it, and I didn't heed God's warning. Okay. Um, but I'd stepped down from the ministry, right? and the house wasn't in order. And I didn't get right back into ministry right away after she had to leave. I didn't get back into ministry right away. I took some time for the Lord. And the Lord's like, okay, let's try it again. Are you going to listen to me this time? The littlest things you allow into your life, the, the mistakes in your life, things, not the littlest things, but there's big things you can allow into your life that can start destroying the ministry. Your ability to be fruitful in the ministry. And I knew I couldn't do the ministry and take care of my wife at the same time. I had to step down. Okay. But in the end, I had to sacrifice my wife. Even if I wasn't a man in ministry, I'd had to sacrifice my wife. There's tons of testimonies of brethren out there and sisters in Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ, that lost the other because they stood for absolute truth. Okay, I lost my daughter. Sacrifice. Okay. When, uh, before I got saved as a professing Christian, and I hope you guys can still see me because I can't see the camera hardly anymore because of the glare. Because um, the, the sun's right back there. It might be too much of a glare, but hopefully you can hear me when we get through this. But before I got saved, we celebrated Easter, Halloween, Christmas. I had video games. I had Hollywood movies. She had her own TV in her room and a game system. And we went out to eat a lot. We went out to the movies a lot. We did a lot of worldly, fleshly, sinful things. And when I got saved, born again, God started cleaning up my life, and I had to start standing up to her and preaching truth to her. And this is a girl that was um, eight years old when I got saved. Eight to ten years old. Like I said, sometimes I say eight years, but seven years. So if it's seven years, okay, she was almost ten years old. 
I had to do the math in my head. She was almost 10 years old. This is a 10 year old child that I'm having to tell the truth to, having to admit that I was wrong. And that's the hard thing too. It gets, uh, some people are like, what do I tell my son or my daughter? You tell them the truth. Okay? It was hard to tell her the truth. Video games are bad. That's why we had to give them up. I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And our home here, when you're with me, this is a Bible-believing, God-fearing home. And we can't do those wicked things anymore. The things that God hates is sin. And I had to try to explain it to her. We don't do the, ho the, the, the holidays, the flesh days. Okay? We don't do the movies. Okay? We're going to try to start eating healthy. I moved out here. She came out here. We started eating healthy. We started doing things with our hands, work with our hands, have fun walking on the beach, go for hikes. Okay, I got a garden. I've got chickens. Okay. But in the end, I had to keep standing for absolute truth. And what did it cost me? It cost me my daughter. I, I guess I, I still said it before in another mess, message or video. Um, the only reason I stayed on, on Facebook, because I really don't like Facebook. The only reason I stayed on Facebook is because that was the way she wanted to keep contact where she could message me and we could talk back and forth and she could let me know how she's doing and if she needed help with anything, I could be there for her physically, um, spiritually. Like I said, when she started getting older, I started telling her about Jesus Christ. We used to always do Bible studies as far as, not Bible studies, we'd read the Old Testament, the, old, the certain stories in the Old Testament and we'd have the computer right there because I had a big theater room that had a huge screen TV that I hooked my computer up to and I got rid of the movies and I was like well let's look at pictures so we'd look up animals we'd look up places and when the Bible said something about something like conies in the hillside okay what are conies let's look that up they're bunnies look at these bunnies they're in the, in the mountains and everything we do stuff like that and so I read the Bible to her and she knew about Jesus from me um, the Jesus from the King James Bible, praise the Lord. But in the end, she chose the world. She was going in a direction, just like my ex-wife, she was going in a direction that I couldn't follow. And I, she's blocked me on Facebook. So I'm thinking I'm going to drop Facebook. You know, part of me leaves it open as hope that maybe she'll unblock me and say, Hello, Dad, and I can see how she's doing. Okay. But when you get saved, not just ministry, but when you get saved, you're going to end up making a lot of spiritual sacrifices. Right? And I already mentioned family. But the sacrifices I make in ministry is I sacrifice my time. Remember what it said about laboring for those who labor in the word and doctrine? You sacrifice a lot of your time. Right? Lately, I haven't been going to the beach that much. I haven't been doing a lot. Um, but, brothers and sisters in Christ, be careful to be quick to judge somebody who's a man who's trying to preach absolute truth. If, so, if someone asks me, well, will you debunk this person? Will you debunk that person? All I ask them is, is, are they using a King James Bible? Well, no, they're not using a King James Bible. Then the brethren have already debunked them. Anybody who's looking for absolute truth and comes to my channel, the King James Bible is God's perfect written word. Then they go to that channel they want me to debunk. Well, they're using other Bible perversions. I've already said, if they don't use a King James Bible, I don't need to debunk them. You don't have anything to do with a ministry that uses Bible perversions. I've linked the Bible version issue to a lot of ministries that are using Bible perversions. I've talked to people around here who profess to be saved. Okay? Okay? Are they using the King James Bible? Now, are they believing in it and not correcting it? Here's the major doctrines. You know, the true plan of salvation, repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer, and ask God to save you. Do they preach that as the true plan of salvation? Repentance is having godly sorrow for your personal sins that you've sinned against God. Not that the whole world is a sinner, or that he's a sinner over there, or she's a sinner over there, that you personally are a sinner that has sinned against God. Okay? Or they mess up repentance. If they don't get the gospel right, have nothing to do with that ministry. The major doctrines, um, the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away the body of Christ, eternal security. They teach anything other than eternal security for this dispensation from the death of Jesus Christ to the catching away of the body of Christ. They have nothing to do with them if they don't teach eternal security. Um, catching away of the body of Christ. Well, he teaches post or mid-trip. I wouldn't have anything to do with them because they're going to be very, very messed up and they're going to mess you up. 
okay? Uh, dispensationalism is true to Bible teaching. Well, they're not dispensational. They believe the whole Bible is written for us and to us. See, the whole Bible is written for us, but the whole Bible isn't written to us. There are certain different dispensations where the Bible is written to these people in this time period, written to these people in this time period, okay? They're not dispensational. They're going to be so messed up. Stay away from them. Okay, the Godhead comes along. You can have somebody that accidentally uses the term, Trinity terms, but they teach and preach the Godhead, body, soul, and spirit. God the Father is the soul. Jesus is the body. The Son of God is the body. Son of God. Jesus is the body of God. God the Father is the soul. And then you have the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit. Okay, body, soul, and spirit. These three are one. That's the Godhead. There's not three persons. It's one person. You say, well, no, they, they teach it's three persons and, you know, three gods, basically, lowercase g gods, and it's not body, soul, and spirit. They each have their own body, soul, and spirit. Have nothing to do with them. If you go to try to correct them on Trinity and they, uh, uh, using Godhead, the Bible uh, title for God, and they keep using Trinity and, and this, and they won't give it up, you're going to have to break fellowship with them. Because they're going to make a mess of scripture and they're going to promote the Jesus Christ of the world, the Antichrist of the world. We're going to be talking about that in another study, the greatest uh, uh, counterfeit. Okay? They're going to be promoting the Jesus of the world, the false Jesus, which is the Antichrist, when they promote the Trinity. But I don't have to debunk them if, if you follow my ministry and what I teach and I put in a lot of Brother Brian's teachings and some of the other brethren's teachings because they did a better job and it's great. We might go over it, or I might sit there and do the same teaching to a brother in Christ one-on-one, -on -one, which I do sometimes on Skype. Um, but I don't need to debunk them. Okay, the ones that I have some brethren out there that feel really called to debunk some of the people out there, the people that really need debunking are the ones that claim to be Bible believers. King James Bible believers, they're very close. They teach the same, they claim to believe the same salvation. They claim to believe this, they claim to believe that. And you actually look at their ministry and they don't. They keep doubting, changing salvation. They keep changing the definition of repentance. Okay, they keep coming back saying, well, prayer's there. And then over here they say, well, prayer isn't there. Well, prayer's there. And then prayer, and they, those are the ones that need to be debunked. Okay, if someone is looking for absolute truth, they will find it. They will find it. So, the number one thing is, brother and sister Christ, it's hard to have bold. Two things: it's hard to have boldness when it comes to correcting a brother in Christ. And when you get corrected, I never mentioned this, but when you get corrected, make sure you're not having that shield of pride up, stubbornness and pride. Okay, make sure that you're like, okay, I'm going to come at this with an open heart, with by the Holy Spirit and by the Word of God. Let's see if they're right. There's times brethren have corrected me, and they're a hundred percent right. Okay, and there's times brethren have corrected me, and I look at the scriptures, and I don't go, man, that you're just so, you know, getting prideful or anything. I go, okay, I don't, I think they're kind of messed up, but let's see what the scriptures say. Okay, okay, they're wrong. I did, I'm not the one that's wrong. They are. Okay, that's the attitude you need to have when being corrected. But when you're going to correct somebody, it takes boldness. Okay, and you got to do it with love, and you got to make sure you do it the right way. Not the wrong way like I did, okay? Go to that brother or sister in Christ, correct them through Scripture. If it's a man in ministry, an elder in the church, make sure that you go to them one-on-one, -on -one, then take two or three elder, uh, other brethren with you, preferably ones that you think that that person uh, would respect and listen to, and try to preach truth to them. And bottom line, once you've preached truth to them, you give them to the Lord. Remember, he's saved. Brother Brian's saved. I'm saved. Anybody, if the brother you're trying to correct is saved, they're in God's hands. Okay? No man uh, uh, can take him out of my father's hands. No man can take him out of my hand. Okay? No, uh, in Christ alone, one of the verses that says, No scheme of man can take me from his hand. Okay? He's in God's hands. Let God deal with it. Pray for that brother. Keep praying and praying. I keep praying for the brethren. Okay, I pray for Brother Brian. Keep praying. Okay, I'm pretty sure, and I pray that he's praying for me and that, you know, 
and the brethren too, and I, I know he is, but I just pray for the situation, us butting heads, that he'll pray for me, okay? And not build up this bitterness and hate towards a brother in Christ. And <clears throat> that's why I took him down, because I name called him. That's my apologies. I'm so sorry that I've failed the body of Christ in this area by not doing it right, and I've apologize to Brother Brian publicly for not coming to him. Um, we're almost done. I just want to talk about this. Now we talked about elders. Okay, we talked about elders. But the number one fault when you read the scriptures, the number one fault that an elder will fall into, and you got to be careful because it says before two or three witnesses. In other words, there's going to be situations where an elder does need to be corrected or else it wouldn't have given us, told us how to correct an elder. Okay. But if you look at church history, <laughs> I came across the guys like, I go off church history and the Bible. And I'm like, I should have asked him. I was just tired that day. I should have asked him. Um, I just, I, pre I, I linked the gospel message and I linked the Bible version issue. And I always didn't want to do nothing. But I should have asked him, when, the, when chur church history goes against the word of God, which one do you follow? You know? Well, the, I was thinking, because the way he talked about the Bible, I'd go off the Bible. Then why are you even following church history as the foundation? You know, why don't you just follow the Bible and see if the church history lines up with the Bible? If it does, woo! If it doesn't, have nothing to do with it. But why isn't the Bible just your final authority? Okay. Right. The number one fault of an elder, we're going to read it right here, that they fall into. Turn to Matthew chapter 15, verse 1. Matthew chapter 15, verse 1. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? They're coming to him saying, Your, your disciples are tra transgressing the traditions of the elders. For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandments of God? By your traditions. For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that cursed his father and mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandments of God of none effect by your traditions. What's the number one thing that an elder has to fight, no matter how old they are? You know, have you heard that saying, they're set in their ways, they're so old, they're set in their ways. Elders have to fight to make sure that they don't get stuck in the traditions of men over the Word of God. Right. Turn to Colossians 2.6. That's the number one mistake that elders will make, is they'll get stuck in the traditions that we've always done it this way. We've always done it this way. The church, the body of Christ is always the church fathers said it was okay so we've always followed it because the church fathers said it was okay but what does the scripture say Colossians 2 6 there's not one man that I've seen in ministry that not in some way and I'm not I, and I'm praying for myself and I probably failed it too that f make the mistake of bringing in traditions of men and holding it above the scriptures it's a hard fight Okay, when I first got saved, I'll admit I did make a lot of mistakes. When I first got saved, I came out of the Bible building system. I joined the military. I came out of the military, uh, retired, and then I'm um, came out of the military, retired, and then I got saved. But because of all that Bible building stuff, I was taught a lot of bad stuff: traditions of men, words of men, uh, false doctrine, and everything. And I brought some of that stuff into being a Christian and into my talks with brethren online. Not to ministry, because I didn't get into ministry right away. I tried to learn the Bible. I tried making sure that God could sanctify my life. He can, and He did, and got my life cleaned up. He changed my life. But I brought a lot of baggage into it that I made a lot of mistakes. Well, this is the truth. And someone online says, chapter and verse. And I'm like, oh, right, chapter and verse. Where did I get that from? And then I realized it's traditions of men. Mm -hmm. Colossians 2 6. As ye have seen therefore let's see, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Rooted and built up in him, 
and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving, as ye have been taught. Today it's chapter and verse. As ye have been taught. What happens when you go with what the world says? Verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Not after Christ. What happens when you fall into the trap of the rudiments of the world, the traditions of men, and philosophy? You, stop, you start losing sight of Jesus Christ. This is a warning to the brethren. You start losing sight of Jesus Christ and your eyes start going on the world and the ways of the world and the traditions of men. Okay. I'm about to throw this book away. I don't know if we will do any more of this, these studies. Um, I don't know if the brethren were into these studies or not, but uh, this was the, we used to do the Catechism of the Protestant Episcopal Church. Catholicism was coming in and it was infiltrating all the the Protestants, the Protestant Reformation, trying to get them back under the authority of Rome. Okay, now first things first, and I know people don't. This isn't the scriptures. Okay, there's two important things that, that I found in this book, and it, it applies to this when it comes to <coughs> traditions of men. Remember what we said: what one thing will an elder go wrong in? they'll start falling into the trap of traditions of men and start trans transgressing the commandments of God. Okay. But right here it says Lesson 32nd, <laughs> 32. And I'll tell you the date when we, get, when we get through this. It says, On what day does the church celebrate the nativity of Jesus Christ our Savior? Answer, on the 20th, 5th day of December. Question. What authority have we for observing this day? What authority have we on observing this day? Answer, the authority of the primitive church. Eight, what pr proof have we of this, I mean, question, what proof have we of this primitive institution? Answer, the observe, observation of this day by all Christians since the time of our Savior. In other words, they couldn't quote scripture and verse, chapter and verse. Remember what the question was, what authority? Chapter and verse. This is all off of traditions of men. You know, and they start going through the uh, stuff that, that sometimes they get truth mixed in with lies. So they start throwing in some stuff. But my thing is, is I found this in here and I was shocked and brethren were asking about it. I found it again. Uh, it was in this book that I found it. If you guys know who Tertullian is, he's the one that was all about philosophy. And Brother Brian comes out and tells us about him and that he came out with helicopter coming. Trinity terms. Where does the Trinity terms come from? The ways of like God through persons and stuff like that. From philosophy. go by. It's, you do a Bible study video, then the, all the planes and the helicopters come by, but when I'm just sitting out normally, they rarely come by. Um, but I found this in here. It said, question, what is the testimony, testimony of Tortullian, who lived in the second century as to the birthday of Christ? Answer, concerning the census of enrollment of Augustus, which the Roman archives preserved as a faithful witness of our Lord's nativity. In other words, they went to him to get help to try to push this Christmas. Okay, why am I saying this? When you go through here, they, they quote scripture when it comes to the actual birth of Jesus Christ, and they're right on. And I want to say this, I'm not against anybody who wants to t pick a day and say, hey, I'm going to take this day to remember the birth of Jesus Christ, do a, a Bible study on the birth of Jesus Christ, tell the story to my kids, whatever. I'm not against that. Okay? I'm not. It's just a lot of the excess practices that come along with, with so-called Christmas. It's all based off traditions of men. And what we just saw there with Tutulian being involved, then you know philosophy was involved. Okay? 
So you got to be careful, brothers and sisters in Christ, that when you're doing something, this is the final authority. The Word of God. Okay? But beware lest any man be spoiled through... I want to read it again. Be, Colossians 2.8 Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Okay? I've seen great men of God, Peter Ruckman, that he was spoiled by philosophy in certain areas of his life. He had some amazing teachings. I've learned stuff from that brother in Christ. I've learned a lot of things from that brother in Christ. But certain areas in his life, he was spoiled by philosophy. My warning that the Lord keeps putting on me is that be careful not to let traditions of men come in. Don't make that mistake. Okay? The Babel building system. If someone's asked me what it is, one of the biggest things we always point out is the Babel building system. Okay, the suit and tie, the clean shaven, and he would always use Trinity terms. He taught the true Godhead of the King James Bible, but he kept using Trinity terms. Why? Because of traditions of men. If you asked him chapter and verse on the title, capital, uh, capital T Trinity is a title for God, he'd be honest with you and say it's not in here. Where is the Babel building's in here. He even had a book that Brother Brian pointed out and um, that he actually admits that yeah these Babel buildings they're not in Scripture. He had to write a whole book trying to explain to people how to do the Babel building system because it wasn't in Scripture. All right. Turn to Ephesians 6.18 Beware lest you be spoiled through philosophy and when you see a brother in Christ that you feel it's starting to fall into that it's hard being bold. Okay, it's hard being bold. And like I said, anytime you go to correct a brother or sister in Christ, you're risking losing fellowship. Ephesians 6.18 Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. That's what I'm trying to do. Verse 19, And for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am ambassador in bonds and that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. But that ye also may know my affairs and how I do. Tychus, I, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things whom I, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose that ye might know our affairs and that he might comfort your hearts. Brothers and sisters in Christ, like I said, we're going to try to get on other subjects, um, but when it comes to certain sins and of any kind, uh, when it comes to Christmas, because some people think I'm just trying to make them miserable or I'm just trying to hurt them, that's not my intention. Okay, that's not my intentions. Okay? I love my brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay? I want to speak boldly as Paul spoke. That's why I tell people be careful when determining salvation issue versus sin issue. Okay? And when you go to uh, correct a brother in Christ, do it with love. Do it with meekness. Okay? Be patient with that brother in Christ. It may take a while for that brother in Christ to see the truth. Be patient. Okay? Verse 23. And we like to let you guys know, and I'll try to be more upcoming about how I'm doing in my life with the Lord, my walk with the life and the ministry and everything. We try to do ministry updates and stuff like that, brethren in ministry. Um, but like I said, I already told you I was getting a little depressed. I, the Bible word is um, sorrows, getting sorrowful of seeing what's going on in the world, getting sorrowful, seeing the falling away of the body of Christ, and it's been really weighing heavily on my heart lately. So I'm going to let you guys know that, and I try to use scripture to lift our hearts back up and lift your hearts back up, okay? But 23, this is my prayer for Brother Brian and his wife and his son. This is my prayer for all the brethren. Whether I believe you're wrong on something, whether I believe you're in sin, this is my prayer for all the brethren. Verse 23, peace be to the brethren and love with faith. From God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 24. Grace be with you all. I said, Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. I had to underline that in my notes. In sincerity. Another way of saying truth. Okay. 
if you truly love the Lord Jesus Christ, okay, you're going to obey His Word. Do your best to obey His Word. It's going to reflect by the life that you're living in sincerity. But notice we have peace and grace there. That's when I end my videos with grace and peace from God, I mean it. I want God's grace on us. I want God's grace on you. I want God's peace on you. God's grace, not just but like if you sin and you need to pick up your cross again. Not just that kind of grace there. I'm talking about grace from this world, from this wicked world. Protection. God's grace. That's what Paul is saying. I want God's grace upon you. His protection on you. This world, even in Paul's day, was falling apart. Turn to 2 Corinthians 13.1. We're going to end with these verses. I'm going to read up reading the whole chapter. Let's see if I'm not jumping the gun. I didn't mean for this to be long. Okay. I want to read the whole chapter with you real quick. This is the third time I'm coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Every word. I told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time and being absent now I write to them which there hitherfore have sinned and to all the others that if I come again I will not spare. He's mad. But he's saying if I, since I had time to be patient God helped him calm down saying you're not going to go to him in this condition you're going to write him a letter. He says I will not spare. Verse 3 Since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me which to you word is not weak, but is mighty in you. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God towards you. Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Remember, it's Corinthians. They're just very sinful and wicked. He's trying to rebuke them and correct them. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. Now I pray to God that ye do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that ye should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. Verse 8. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. I'm not trying to be against the truth, brothers. I've made mistakes. But I'm not trying to be against the truth. I'm trying to be for the truth. Verse 9. And that's our, everyone I've, brothers and sisters in Christ that I've talked to, that's their heart's desire too. We want to be for absolute truth. For we are, for we are glad when we are weak and ye are strong. And this also we wish, even your perfection. You know what that means, brothers and Christ? When I fail the Lord, I'm weak. And I look over there and I see that you're strong. You're still standing for the Lord. You're not making the same mistakes I'm making. You're not struggling as hardcore with sin as I'm struggling with sin. When, am I, when I'm weak, you're strong and you can lift me up. You can encourage me to get back on the right track. Here's my hand out to lift a brother, sister in Christ back up on their feet. Get back to serving the Lord. Get back to get that sin out of your life. Get back to doing what's right. Get that fellowship back with a brother in Christ. Don't be prideful. Let it go. Verse 9. For we are glad when we are weak and ye are strong, and this also we wish even your perfection. Verse 10. Therefore I write these things being absent, lest being present I should use sharpness. According to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification and not to destruction. Boldness. That's boldness, writing a letter like that. But he's saying, I'm, I'm just frustrated with how wicked the sin, I've preached truth to you, the wicked sin that's going on. If I was present, boy, I'd really be going in, tearing into you guys, verbally. Okay. Verse 11, but finally, finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. That's what I've always preached, brother and sister Christ. We need to be of one mind. When you, the world comes in, traditions of men, philosophy, rudiments of the world, when you have wolves in sheep's clothing, Paul crying night and day because wolves in sheep's clothing coming in uh, and scattering the flock, he wants us to be of good, be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind. He's talking about the perfect heart, not sinless perfection, but a perfect heart with the Lord. Your heartfelt desire, you hate sin, you want to please God, 
you're hiding God's word in your heart that I might not sin against thee, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. You're hiding God's word in your heart, and God's word is perfect. That's how you can have a perfect heart, living a life of Christ. Be of one mind. Live in peace. Brothers and sisters of Christ, live in peace. Grace and peace from God our Father. That's why I preach that, so we have peace. There's so many people falling away. So many people are just fighting each other. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints salute you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy, Spirit, holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. There we see the grace and peace again. And communion of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in me bearing witness with the Holy Spirit that's in you. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we're supposed to speak boldly. And there's times, but there's a way we're supposed to go about doing it. Okay? We're supposed to do it according to the Bible. Okay? You go to that brother and sister in Christ one-on-one. -on -one. Then you take two or three witnesses. Okay? And if they won't listen to you, let God deal with them. They're in God's hands. You're trying to correct a brother. You, there's no point in correcting someone who's lost. You let them know that you're their sinners. You can read the Ten Commandments to them. And you give them the plan of salvation. And you're done. Don't cast your pearls before swine. Don't ca cast that which is holy among the dogs. Okay? The Holy Commandments of God. Other than the command to obey the gospel. You preach the plan of salvation to them. That's it. And you're done. But when it comes to a brother, sister in Christ, make sure you're doing it the right way according to Scripture. Talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, then bring two or three witnesses, okay? Especially when it comes to an elder in the church. I'll say this again. I was wrong in the sense that I shouldn't have name-dropped him. I should have gone, I name-dropped him. I shouldn't have mentioned Brian's name. I should have gone and talked to him personally, one-on-one. -on -one. And then, like I said, if he wouldn't listen to me and it really still was a burden on my heart, I should have gone with two or three witnesses, okay? I didn't. My biggest thing is, is liberty, just trying to preach what true liberty is in the Bible. Um, so just please, brothers and sisters in Christ, that's my prayer for all of you. Peace, comfort, that you stay the course. That's why I'm always trying to preach, just keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Be perfect, but stay the course. Don't be one of the, people, the brethren that are falling away. Don't have Jesus Christ call us home any day now and find you fallen flat on your face. You don't want that. Okay? And I got my battery looks like it's really low. But real quick, brethren, you don't some brethren don't understand how close we are. The one world currency is already here. People say, no, it isn't. Yes, it is. What's it called? Electronic currency. That's the one world currency. It's electronic. When I was in the military, and it's been here for a long time. When I was in the military traveling the world, I could use my debit card at any ATM and pull out local currency and it would automatically do the whatever it does to say what the dollar is versus the peso or the yen or whatever country I was in okay it would do automatically do it all and then today you can purchase things from other countries um, and whatnot it's all electronic currency even American cash the banks don't even have a fraction of the total amount that they claim for the people that use the bank on hand. It's all digital. The one world currency is here. It's digital. It just needs to be linked up to the mark of the beast. It's already here. Two, the one world order. It's already here. The Jesuit order infiltrating every religion, infiltrating every country. They're just waiting for the right setting, that, that uh, man of sin, the perdition, to show up for them to get started. Okay, people say, well, what about the technology for the mark of the beast? We've seen technology that we say that this is leading to the mark of the beast, but it might be another six years before the technology is there. Any technology that we see that comes out for the public view, they've held on to for about 15, 20, 30 years. So if they've got technology that we can see today that's like that's really close to the mark of the beast, you better believe they have the technology for the mark of the beast. We are in the last days, brothers and sisters of Christ. Jesus can come back any moment. My, my heartfelt plea is don't let him come back and find you falling flat on your face. Okay? 
have him come back and find you standing the course. Okay, be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Finding the brethren of one mind. Live in peace. Finding those of us that are still standing, being at peace with one another. Not fighting amongst the amongst brethren. Okay? And the God of love and peace shall be with you. You want love in your God's love on you in this life? You know, as far as in this life, with this wicked sinful flesh, do your best to keep standing for the Lord. When I get miserable and my life tends to fall apart, when I was newly saved, I, I was, it's the struggle with the flesh, falling away, struggling, falling away, and struggling, okay? The more God gets your life in order, the more life, God helps you get that flesh under control and gets the sin out of your life, the more you're going to see God's love in your life. You look back and go, wow, God really loved me to put up with me. Really? Because when I got saved, my life was just a complete mess. God had a lot of cleaning up to do. It was just tons of garbage in my life. And when you got most of it out, you look back and go, wow, did God have so much love for me and patience to help me get through that, to help clean my life up. That's why the Bible warns us to be careful about certain judgments in the sense that, remember, you were lost once. So how we treat the lost world, we got to remember, we were lost once. You preach the gospel with love, with patience, meekness, okay, with peace. That's why it's called the gospel of peace. Okay, you don't go getting mad and yelling and, and yelling at people. That doesn't do anything. Okay, greet one another with a holy kiss. There's that peace among the brethren. Okay, all saints salute you. So I'll end this with this. Grace and peace from God our Father. Grace be upon you all. And peace in all your lives, brothers and sisters of Christ. There's a lot of brethren out there that are having a hard time having to deal with the lost world more than some of us, some of the other brethren have to. I pray for peace in the life of the brethren and grace. God's grace. So grace and peace from God our Father. And my love for you, my love for you, my great love for you, brothers and sisters of Christ, is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Okay? When I correct a brother in Christ, I try to do it out of love. Sometimes I can get agitated and I can start coming across and I can fail and do it the wrong way. Okay? But my intentions are love. My intentions are I want to see you get back on the right path. My love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, so sorry for how long this study was. It wasn't supposed to be this long, but it was long. But I just want to say thank you, brothers and sisters in Christ, for everything you've done for me. We're going to get into some other studies. Okay? But I'll talk to you later. Or see you in another video.